Welcome to Library Seminars, a platform for the presentation of ideas, research, and news in support of NOAA's mission. I'm Lisa Clark, Reference Librarian at the NOAA Central Library. Today's seminar is titled Ecosystem-Linked Assessment Model for Gulf of Alaska Pacific Cod to Assess Climate Change-Driven Changes in Productivity. The presentation is part of the National Stock Assessment Science Seminar Series, which is developed by NOAA Fisheries and organized by Kristen Blackheart, who will be introducing our speaker, Dr. Stephen Barbeau. Before I hand the mic to Kristen, here are a few logistical tips to help you enjoy your presentation. If you're having trouble with the audio or the visual components of GoToWebinar, please log out and rejoin us. This resets the software and resolves most technical issues. Our presentation is being recorded and will be available on the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel by tomorrow morning. We will also be accepting questions throughout the seminar, which Steve will address at the end of his presentation. Please feel free to type your questions in the questions chat box on the right side of your screen at any time. If you're interested in the slides from today's presentation, you can down them, download them from the handouts menu, which is also on the right. So with that last detail, let's start this seminar. The mic is yours, Kristen. Thanks, Lisa. Um, before I introduce our speaker, uh, just a quick reminder that this is actually part of a uh, two seminar mini series. We're partnering with the EBM, EBFM series. Um, so part two will be next Wednesday at the same time um, with a presentation titled Using Ecosystem-Based Fisheries Management to Address Climate-Related Impacts to Gulf of Alaska Pacific Cod. So kind of the um, applications and implementation of the work that Steve will be talking about today. Um, and that will be presented by Stephanie Zador. Um, so with that, I am so pleased to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Steve Barbeau. Uh, Steve is a graduate of the University of Washington, a very fine institution indeed. Um, he started his career with NOAA as a fishery observer in Alaska and now works as a fisheries research biologist at the Alaska Center and is the lead stock assessment author for the Gulf of Alaska Pacific cod stock, um, which he'll be talking to us about today. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Steve. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yep, today I'm going to be talking about ecosystem linked assessment model for Gulf of Alaska Pacific Cod and really using that to assess climate change driven changes in productivity. And this work I've kind of just finished this week, so we'll see how <laughs> this goes. Um, uh, content wise, I'm going to talk about the stock history, go into the base assessment that was used for management last year and kind of discuss the ecosystem link models, um, look at how we might project these in the future using climate projections from CMIP-5, um, discuss those and look over those model projections, uh, kind of quick overview of our plans for future research, and then a, a short summary. Um, for the Gulf of Alaska cod, um, this kind of sums it all up, kind of like a lot of the cod stocks. Um, if you can't read it, it says, would you please elaborate on then something bad happened? Um, it's kind of the history of COD uh, for quite a while. And to kind of give you an overview of where we're at and kind of a scale, uh, this shows the Gulf of Alaska um, here. From Ketchikan to Dutch Harbor is about 1,350 miles, which for those on the East Coast is equivalent to um, the distance from Bar Harbor to uh, Miami, Florida, so quite a large area. For those on the West Coast, it's the same distance from Cape Flattery, Washington, down to Ensenada, California. So quite a large area. We have one single stock um, for this region. Issues. So the, the Pacific cod stock is historically important for Alaskan coastal communities. We can find otoliths and bones in middens that date back 6,000 years. One of the interesting names for this stock, um, local Aleut name, is Atitax, which is um, the fish that stops, which is kind of prescient for um, what happened with the stock. The uh, commercial fishery, the American commercial fishery, began in 1863 as a salt cod fishery, and it collapsed in the 1930s and 40s. We don't really know why. Um, there was talk of economic collapse, but there's also some sign that there was a biological collapse for the stock at that time period as well. 
the modern fishery really took off um, in the 1980s with the gadded boom. And here in this figure on the x-axis is the year and y-axis is tons, the top being tons of spawning stock biomass, the bottom in red being catch. You can see that the stock really took off in the 80s, peaking in 1990, and as well as catch kind of taking off. And that uh, occurred at a same, same time period where we see this large increase in recruitment. Um, look forward from 1990 through um, the early 2000s, we see a long, slow decline in this stock um, for 20 years. But the fishery stayed fairly much the same and actually increased a bit. Again, this was due to primarily this drop in recruitment during that time period as well. Um, but then back in 2008 through 2014, we see this increase, large increase in recruitment. It looked like we were actually heading uh, to a good place. On average, the fishery was making about $103 million a year in wholesale value and made up about 30% of the ground fish revenue for this time period. Um, what we expected from the stock assessment model, uh, given this large recruitment and, and uh, average recruitment afterwards was this sharp increase um, in, in spawning stock biomass, which seemed like a good thing. Um, it's kind of what we were expecting, what we were managing on. But what actually happened was this large collapse in 2015, 2019, sudden drop in both um, the adult population as well as recruitment and catch dropped um, with management at the same time period. So if you look at the management response to this, there was an 80% reduction in ABC in 2018, um, down to 88, from 88,000 tons in 2017 to about 15,000 tons in 2018, a 69% reduction from 2017. So this brought the fishery from um, 100 million to 75 million to 32 million quite rapidly. And then following that up in 2019, um, it was further reduced to 17,000 tons and a fishery disaster was declared um, the 25th of September in 2019. In 2020, um, the stock continued to drop and we actually closed the fishery to directed um, fishing, uh, the federal fishery. This was due to us um, going below the 20% unfished spawning biomass. And this is a level um, in our rules um, for stellar sea lion forage. If we drop below being 20, um, we actually shut down the fishery. Uh, the fishery actually is going to be open in 2021 as the stock increased above B20 to about B21, B22 in our current models. Uh, so why the collapse? What happened? Um, as far as we can tell, one of the big issues that occurred at this time period on this figure is the degree Celsius from the mean for the time of year from 1982 through 2020. The straight blue line here being the mean temperature, sea surface temperature. Uh, blue line being um, the daily um, mean temperature. And each of these red points is actually the um, heat wave. The heat wave being defined as temperatures greater, greater than the 90th percentile for more than five days. You can see that we've had heat waves in the past on occasion, particularly in the mid 2000s. But then what happened in 2014 to 2016 was this extreme heat wave that just didn't go away. Um, it stayed warm from 2014 through 2016 cooled off in 2017 and 2018, then warmed up again in 2019. Um, this is basically the sum of degrees um, Celsius days for those time periods. You can see that this really was um, exceptional for that time period. And not only was it in sea surface temperature, but also down to about 300 meters where we had this warming during this time period. This had ecological impacts across the board in the Gulf of Alaska. Although we did have a higher mesozooplankton abundance, there were a lot fewer of these large lipid-rich copepods. Uh, we had low euphausid abundance, large fish, uh, forage fish abundance, and lower forage fish quality during that time period. It had impacts throughout the ecosystem um, from large to small. And we had large uh, scale die-offs of seabirds and reproductive failure, as well as increasing large whale strandings and a, a large mortality event for these species. For cod, we see something similar. What we see is in the stomach data. So this is specific. Um, this measures the uh, quantity and quality of the diet for Pacific cod. And we see during those heat wave years, 2015, 2017, it dropped up quite a bit. If you look at the bioenergetics, we see this um, with these active terms, we see this large increase in daily metabolic demand and dropping growth as there was lower prey. So higher metabolism in warmer temps led to higher forage requirements, 
but there is lower forage availability in quality during the pickling led to lower growth potential. If we look at what that happened in the fishery, what we see in those years was this drop in poor conditions. So this is the length weight residual um, for cod. See fairly high in 2006, dropping down to the lowest on record being 2016, um, really small skinny cod. So in summary for the um, bioenergetics hypothesis, uh, warmer temperatures were throughout the year in water column. Higher metabolism of warmer temps led to higher forage requirements. Indications of lower forage amounts in 2015 to 2016. This combination likely led to higher Pacific cod natural mortality for the heat wave years. Um, this was addressed also by Pyatt for seabirds as uh, described as an ectothermic vice. So basically you have ramping up of metabolism while there being lower forage um, and forage being taken up by the massive predators. We also had another issue with cod during this time period and um, something explored by Laurel and Rogers in their 2020 paper um, was temperature and egg and larvae survive, larval survival. What we can see for cod here on the top left figure, the proportion of successful hatch by temperature. And so we have this very narrow range where we have successful hatch for Pacific cod uh, in the Gulf of Alaska and fairly steep sides. And we can look at the survival of larvae during this time period with that suitability uh, have had any depths. And so suitability goes down, we get much lower survival. And this is um, looking at GAC1. There's a set of series of um, moorings for ping temperature. And we can see that throughout this time period, fairly good survival. Um, who have that suitability being fairly well, large portions of it. Looking at 2015, 2016, and 2019, where this basically goes near, down near to zero for much of the Gulf of the Lab for, for these regions. So these laboratory studies indicate increasing temperature results in lower egg survival and fewer larvae. We can see this in recruitment. So this blue line is the inverse of age one recruitment. And it tracks really well with temperature, the red line in the Gulf of Alaska. So again, lower recruitment trends with those higher water temperatures. So in summary, we have higher natural mortality of Pacific cod across ages, which led to immediate drop in the overall spawning biomass. So we see that sharp drop in 2015, 2016 in the adult population. And then low, low egg and larval survival led to continued low spawning biomass through 2020. So because we didn't get that recruitment, we don't have replacement and that stock um, basically has a hangover from those warmer temperatures. Um, future temperature projections predict increases in temperature and frequency of heat waves. Um, so it doesn't look good. So that's something that we wanted to examine in these ecosystem models. So the Gulf of Alaska Pacific Cod model is stock synthesis. Uh, right here is kind of me working on the top of the pile of data, kind of cram it into the, the stock assessment model uh, and stock synthesis model, I'm kind of stirring it around, kind of, kind of my job. Stock synthesis, um, generalized stock assessment program uh, developed um, by Rick Mathot. Um, Statistical age structured population model framework. framework is pretty flexible, incorporates multiple data sources and account for biological and environmental processes. Um, it has a history going back about 35 years. It was initially developed as an anchovy synthesis in 1985 with various versions moving forward to the latest version um, that I'm using, which was developed on December 1st, 2020, um, version stock synthesis 3.30. Um, stock synthesis is pretty widely used. Um, it has a dedicated team of developers and a large number of collaborator, collaborators for development and testing. Um, there is a virtual lab available, and here's the link to that virtual lab if you want to go and look for yourself. Um, this process both has a fairly large online community that works together on problems, as well as a development team that looks at developing new, new things for this model and making it more um, useful for our current problems. For the Gulf of Alaska cod stock assessment, um, general setup within stock synthesis, it's a single stock for the Gulf of Alaska, the single season, a single sex, fairly simple model, um, ages one to 10 plus age bins, uh, one to 117 centimeter length bins, three fisheries, the longline trawl and pot fishery are included in the model, and two surveys, the AFSC bottom trawl survey and the AFSC longline survey. Growth is modeled as a single three parameter von Bertel lamprey growth. Uh, informative priors based on the survey composition data. Uh, we also assume an aging bias pre 2007 um, as we improved our, our aging recently. 
Maturity is length-based um, logistics, and that's fixed within the model. We have natural mortality. Mortality within the model is a bit different. Um, it's log normal prior based on the literature, but we have M fits separately for the heat wave years. So looking at 2014 through 16 as a block. Um, all of this can be found um, both in the stock assessment, but also the control and data files are available online at this link here. So you can actually go in and pull down those uh, control and data files and, and run the model yourself if you wish to. Recruitment, um, Beverton Holt spawn a recruitment relationship, sigma R 0.44 and a steepness of one, which basically turns it into uh, average recruitment for projections. R0 is uninformative uniform prior, and we have a regime change um, on R0 assumed in 1977, which is fit with, a, with an uninformative prior. So we're looking at that gadded bloom in 1978 forward as being a different regime within this model. Um, fishing mortality is a hybrid model um, where we use the pro Pope's approximation to provide initial values and iterative adjustments for the TNS. Selectivity is length-based six-parameter double normal selectivity for all size composition. We have blocks uh, for the bottom troll survey based on survey changes and longline and troll fishery pre-1990 is annually varying um, blocks for the post-1990 based on some of the management changes that we had. Uh, the pot fishery um, is rather new fishery and we only have a single selectivity curve for that. Uh, the, this model, model 19.1, was used for management in 2020 and 2021 with updated data. This has been used for two years now. One of the things that's within this model is an, um, is an ecosystem link. And within stock synthesis, there are two ways of dealing with environmental. You can put it in as an environmental index, index specifically. So the index treated directly as an indicator index. Um, for instance, you could use a habitat index if it was a good indicator of age zero fish, but it requires assumptions on selectivity and catchability. A second way is the environmental link, and this index scales individual parameters. So basically you put the index directly on an individual parameter and it scales that based on the environmental link. Um, there's three options within stock synthesis for doing this, the multiplicative, um, which basically has this exponential type um, relationship, additive, which is fairly linear, and then logistic, which of course has that logistic curve, which you can see on the right. Um, for mo all of the models that I've done um, within the stock assessment I'm using, that I'm showing, is the multiplicative. Um, I've explored a lot of different relationships, but this is the one that I'm presenting today um, for most of these. And in the base model, we have one thing that uses this environmental link, and that is catchability. Um, so we use an uninformative prior for both surveys on catchability, but the long line survey catchability is linked to June CFSR water temperature anomaly, and it's a multiplicative one. Basically warm temperatures, on this figure here, we have depth by temperature for the bottom trawl survey. What we can see for these larger fish, blue being cold years, red being warm years. And so in those warm years, we get this downward shift of, of cod from uh, for about 20 to 30 meters uh, shifting down during those warm years. The long line survey depth starts at about 140 meters, which is at kind of the edge of the range of the specific cod for this region. And so what we get in these warm years is these fish becoming more available for this long line survey. And that's modeled um, as that environmental link with those June temperatures within this base model. This has been used in this base model since uh, 2018. So it's been a couple more iterations where it's been included. We can look at what that means for catchability. Here being the June uh, Gulf of Alaska temperature anomaly, uh, going from negative 0.5, actually close to negative one, all the way up to positive one and a half. Um, we can see that effect in catchability here from a little over one to up near 1.7 uh, across the board on, on a lot of these catchability features. The data that we're fitting into these models can be seen here, again, um, we have trawl, long line, and pot fishery data dating back to 1977. Uh, abundance indices starting um, in 1990 uh, forward. So bottom trawl survey, long line survey. We have conditional, or we have length composition data for all of the components going back to the beginning of each of these components. And then conditional age at length compositions are used within this data as well um, for most of the sectors. Again, being fairly limited for the fishery, but going back to 1990 for the survey.
model results for 2021, national mortality um, is a bit higher than what you're seeing for Atlantic cod and, and also Bering Sea cod, um, 0.47, uh, fairly tight CV around these estimates. Um, 2014-16 block, it actually shoots up to 0.82 for this time period. Um, Q uh, for catchability for the bottom trawl survey, about 1.16 for the bottom trawl. Um, for the for the long line survey, we're looking at something a little tighter, 1.19, but then we have the environmental link of 0.94, which again, I showed you earlier. Uh, I'm showing that Q being variable uh, based on gene temperatures. CR selectivity curves, most of them are um, asymptotic. We do see some dome shape selectivity for bottom trawl survey early years and also the pot fishery asymptotic um, and the long line survey, but most of them being, uh, I mean, being dome shaped for those earlier years, most of those being asymptotic. The fits are fairly close um, for the bottom trawl survey. One year that we missed that 2009, which has been problematic, there's a couple toes that ended up with lots of age one fish. So that wasn't fit very well, but for the most part, it fits the surveys fairly well. And the long line survey fit very well across the board. You see the fits to the um, length composition data um, are very tight for all of the sectors. Uh, this is basically something all of them across the board. I mean, there is some variability, particularly in the survey, but for the most part, it fits these data really tightly. Looking at results of recruitment, um, poor recruitment since 2014, we were showing you before. Um, the recent fishery carried 2010-13 year classes. So we have this large recruitment that carried that increase in abundance that we saw. 2018 recruitment is near average. 2019 recruitment in this model, um, because it doesn't have any environmental links on the biological aspects, does show it near average, and it's simply because we don't have any information informing this data point. So if you look at 2019, 2021, 20, they're approaching average um, simply because there's not a lot of information informing that. This is something that we're going to talk about a little bit later with some of our more advanced um, ecosystem link models. You can see again this drop in abundance from uh, 1990 down to 2000s, a slight increase then drop again to recent time periods to this uptick in 2020 and 21. 2020 being the bottom, 2021, we start seeing this uptick in spawning biomass. Total biomass, this very sharp drop um, from 2014 onward, and then slight increase as, we're, as we reduce the fishing effort, we start seeing this increase as well as recruitment in 2018. So one of the things that we do in Alaska um, for our management is project forward uh, about 13 years to determine whether we're fished or overfishing. And the model that we're using uh, for the most part for tier ones and tier three species, species that have stock structured or um, age or link structured assessments was developed by Jimmy and Ellen in 1995 called PROJ. And this is a bootstrap method that goes through and basically resamples recruitment with a mean and variance um, for a time period and projects that forward for 13 years. But the only uncertainty that you're seeing really in this projection is based on the um, variability in recruitment. Um, so the estimates reference points, um, unfished spawning biomass, F40, ABC, OFL, et cetera, is based on a baseline and stationary dynamics for the baseline from 1977 to 2018. So it assumes stationarity both in the biology, productivity, and recruitment, and moves that forward based on uncertainty uh, simply in, in the recruitment estimates. So something I wanted to talk about a bit was um, the stationarity. And stationarity um, is basically in time series one whose statistical properties such as a mean variance and autocorrelation are all constant over time. And to get a baseline for our um, reference points, we have to assume some level of stationarity to be able to project that forward. Um, we're basing the future on what we've seen in the past. And so we end up with um, estimates that are based on stationary mean variance that look something like this. But in reality, what may be happening with climate change is something different. We can have stationary mean with increasing variance or a stationary variance with increasing mean or both. Um, Proj, the project program that we're using for projection, uh, calculates reference points based on the 1977 through the present dynamics. So we assume the stationarity forward. Um, so how do we 
potentially deal with that, with climate change. And that's something that I'm gonna discuss. Um, <clears throat> so really one way that we can do this is through ecosystem like models. Um, and this is kind of can make some, some fairly large assumptions about what's happened in the past um, on what we're going to see in the future. So there's two models that I developed um, for this presentation, for this seminar, model 20.1, which is model 19.1 with growth um, based on June temperature anomaly linked mul multiplicative and recruitment, which is heat wave linked multiplicative. On top of that, I have model 21.1, uh, model which is model 20.1 with natural mortality heat wave linked multiplicative. So model 20.1 is looking at growth and recruitment being based on temperature and heat waves. Model 21.1 looking at national mortality being triggered by heat waves. And we can look at that within stock synthesis. So for both of these models, um, recruitment is a von Bertalanffy with multiplicative links, alpha, beta, and gamma to the June CFSR temperature anomalies. So basically you have that simple von Bertalanffy, but we've added a few factors um, for the L0 or L min. Um, this is uh, the relationship that is based on Ben Laurel at all larval growth potential by temperature. So we're looking at that larval growth um, potential um, for each year divided by the potential based on the mean. This gives us kind of an index of larval growth um, based on temperature. On top of that, K can then be scaled um, with our June temperatures as well as L infinity. So this results in a faster growth with increasing temperature and it kind of it creates a dome shaped um, temperature or growth based on temperature uh, with a size that peaks at about 11 and a half degrees Celsius or at the seven degrees Celsius anomaly. We can look at that here. So what we see here is L0 um, based on that relationship that we told Ben Laurel um, 2015 relationship you can see for all of our anomalies, 1977 through 2020, basically fit on uh, this line here. Uh, you can see these blue dots in the upper left are what we've seen so far um, in our time series. If we look at um, projections um, forward using climate, uh, IPCC, CMIP-5 climates um, projections, the most extreme we expect to see, um, given the most extreme assumptions on um, climate change really has us increased to 6.1 degrees Celsius. So we don't even hit the top, the peak of this dome for these growth models yet in our, in our region. And so you'd expect this dome to, to fall off um, up, you know, after seven degrees Celsius. Uh, what this means is percent difference in length for those June anomalies. So as we increase that temperature, um, we see this increase in growth pretty, pretty rapidly for, for a lot of, across different sizes. And again, if you look at the bottom figure, we see that over time, over time series, uh, we see that we have had these periods of increased growth. And they kind of follow this um, cohort effect. A particular cohort does well um, early on in the time in its life, continues to well throughout, but does poorly, uh, continues to poorly. During that cold period in the mid 2000s, where we had um, really good recruitment and we saw the development of the fishery again, we did have slower growth. And we saw smaller fish at age for this time period as well. Um, but we see um, smaller or larger fish um, also that we're seeing in some of these beach sand surveys done by Ben Laurel et al, where we're getting larger fish, even though we have smaller population. Um, you can see this in this weighted age uh, residuals, these pearson residuals. On top of that, we can look at our standard Weber and Holt spawner recruitment relationship based on our heat wave index that I showed earlier. Um, so this is kind of a threshold value. So again, um, high Y in, in the standard Beverton Holt um, is the degree C days as the annual sum of anomaly for days above the 90th percentile for more than five consecutive days in February through March um, with a baseline of 82 2012. And again, we can look at um, our value here, the omega, small omega value which basically scales our recruitment. And what we end up with is a recruitment curve that looks something, looks exactly like this. And so what we have is the standard Beverton Holt recruitment curve that scales down with our temperature, with our heat wave index. Um, the points in the back are our data points and 
um, as far as fitting those data points as good as any stock recruitment curve that I've seen. Um, but again, we're scaling it down. So we see these red hot points being those really high heat wave days versus the blue points being you know, the regular days. So we don't have any change to the recruitment curve until we get above this threshold, um, this heat wave threshold, and then it scales down with those, with those heat waves in this model. And then for model 20.1, instead of that block, so what we've done in the base model 19 is we have a block from 14 to 16, which has increased uh, natural mortality. What we've done in model 20.1 was use that multiplicative um, link uh, to natural mortality fit to this heat wave index. What we see are these blips every time we have a heat wave um, in February. We see these blips of um, increased natural mortality and actually goes quite high, being up 0.9 for this time period during the, during the most recent heat wave period. Um, all of these models that are shown that have these environmental links are, are better fits within the model. They provide a better log likelihood and their objective function is much lower. Um, but um, that's something that we need to test a bit more. So we can take these relationships that we found in these models and project them forward um, using climate directions from uh, I CCC AR5 or CMIP5 RCPs. And here we can kind of give an idea RCP 2.6 being okay, uh, 4.5 increasing, 8.5 being really high. And then, of course, we don't have any of those higher scenarios kind of going off the chart. So CMIP stands for the Coupled Model Intercomparison Project, and it's a standard experimental protocol for coupled atmosphere, ocean, and general circulation models. It's community-based infrastructure in support of climate model diagnosis, validation, intercomparison, comparison, documentation, data access. It's where you go to get data from the AR, the IPCC um, annual reports. Uh, RCPs are the representative concentration pathways, and there are four greenhouse gas concentration trajectories adopted by the IPCC for its fifth assessment report. Um, the four RCPs are CP 2.6, 4.5, 6.0, 8.5, and are named after possible ranges for radiative forcing values in the year 2100. For my projections, I'm going to show in a bit, I only use three of those, 2.6, 4.5, and 8.5. Um, by comparison, current carbon levels are at about 450 parts per million. Our CP 2.6 is about 490 parts per million. Our CP 4.5 is 630, and our CP um, 8.5 is about 1300 parts per million. So we see the scaling up um, of radio forcing. And that's what we're going to be modeling in a moment. And here are the projections for temperature for the Gulf of Alaska. You can see that under RCP6, we kind of get a slight increase, but then it's kind of falls off. And this kind of fits the um, Paris Climate Agreement um, levels. And so we see the slight increase. In the Gulf of Alaska kind of stabilizes after about 2040. RCP 4.5, slightly more increase. Um, it's not stabilizing until about 2060, and then stabilizing out. RCP 8.5 just continue to increase. So current um, emission levels and continue that throughout the, the, through into the future. Here we have February and June both showing, showing similar patterns. Uh, this data is available um, at this website that you see down on the bottom for these time series. So fitting this ecosystem link model projections and climate change, we basically look at our growth, each of these individual um, ecosystem environmentally linked processes. We see for 2.6, um, 1978 through 2020, um, we see that it's fairly flat. Then we see this slight increase that kind of steadies um, throughout 2099. 4.5, again, much deeper increase, but again, flattening out and RCP 8.5 just continue to increase with growth. So this is that growth um, temperature related to growth. We get that increase in growth as we increase temperature. We can also look at recruitment. And this is something interesting. We see the past recruitment being highly variable. Again, that 2.6 continues to be highly variable, but fairly well. This is in orange where we get these peaks in recruitment. Um, a lot of uncertainty around these, these points. Model 4.5, you continue to have those peaks in recruitment, but it kind of stabilizes after 2060, um, not so much. And then um, 
8.5. Again, we see similar to um, 2.6 and 4.5 through about 2045, 2050. And then basically we get poor recruitment going forward um, under that model scenario. We've got natural mortality. This is a bit hard to believe and something that I do need to look into quite a bit more. This is this increasing natural mortality with these heat waves. Under 2.6, again, we have these spikes in natural mortality in our time series up to 2020, but then those types spikes become much more frequent um, into the future, um, more frequent at 4.5, and 8.5 basically just going above 0.9 for the remainder of the century. Again, uh, model 21.1 is something that I put together this week um, and really hasn't been validated that much. It needs a lot more work. There is quite a bit of potential for overestimates of natural mortality um, with this environmental link. It hasn't been fully tested, so not something that I would count on for management at this point. So we can look at that 13-year time period for this model. Um, here, like we did with um, Praj, again, we have that Praj rising up, and that's based on those stationary um, recruitment. So we have that high variability coming up, but it coming up to um, what we call um, B40, um, our management objective uh, over time. But what we can do is look at this with these different models, uh, 2.6, 4.5, and 8.5. Similarly here, this is this model 20, which doesn't have natural mortality in it. It just has the recruitment and growth. And we basically get the same pattern. Um, we see that slight dip here in the mid, right after 2025, 2024, 2025, that we don't see in the project model. And that's due to that 2019 recruitment that we saw drop in the environmental linked model where we had high temperatures in 2019, driving recruitment down. Uh, we see that drop here as well. But again, it all comes up to about the same. Similar across all three models, and there's slightly lower um, spawning stock biomass in 8.5. But again, across the board, it's fairly similar. This changes quite a bit. Um, when we look at adding natural mortality into the model. And here we can see that drop. There's without natural mortality, this is with natural mortality in it. And we see quite a big difference um, moving forward. So it really does impact this, that, that assumption of natural mortality being um, connected with these temperatures. Uh, again, staying well below um, B35 for these stocks um, in the short term. We can look at catch um, also using this. And basically, here's that project model developed by Jimmy and Nelly moving forward 13 years, looking like the standard come out to equilibrium fairly quickly. Similarly, although a bit lower, you can see for all three of our um, RCP assumptions, it's fairly similar. We see some drop-offs later in the time series, but it's fairly close across all three. Um, if we look at that with estimating M within the model, we get quite a big difference where we start seeing these changes and dropping down in productivity in the stock really pretty quickly um, with that increase to M, with increased temperatures. So those, all of those and all of that I've showed you so far have assumptions about um, stationarity in that the stocks and the reference points are all based on our time series from 1977 through 2018. Um, something we can look forward, we can use these models to do is look forward to see how that uh, assumption is may hold in the future. Um, so here we can actually look at that full projection of spawning stock biomass. This is just taking one example, um, 2.6 moving it forward without fishing to estimate future productivity potential for the stock without assumptions of stationarity. So what do our long-term projections look like? So we know that the future is not going to be this mean. This kind of gives us an idea of what the range of values are and on average, what does that mean for this stock? On the left is a stock um, that include, doesn't include natural mortality, um, environmentally linked natural mortality. Uh, the stock on the right, models on the right actually show that with natural mortality we see quite a big difference um, with, if the temperatures are triggering natural mortality, we get quite a big difference from if they're not. Um, and there's reasons why it could or could not, and it's something that we need to kind of balance in these models. 
So this really has the potential to address uncertainty of stationary reference points by projecting forward using management strategy evaluation. So we use these kind of to guide our way forward as to how we manage the stock and how we think about reference points in the future. So this is um, all three models, um, RCP values for 2.6, 4.5, and 8.5. And this is kind of the mean value. And we see without natural mortality, we actually get increased production um, and female spawning biomass over this time period. Um, and this is basically due to that increase in growth overcompensating for that decrease in recruitment. We see a slight decline as we go up with that model 4.5 where it drops down, but then goes back up with 8.5. This is not the case when we actually include that natural mortality and it behaves about the same. But what we do see is that all three models are about the same through about 2050. And then we get this trigger in 2050 for the, where they kind of split out. And so 2.6, um, 4.5, and the lower being 8.5 on the RCPs. So for model 20.1, we do see a drop of about 25 to 40% um, in unfished spawning biomass. And the model 21.1, where we have that national mortality, we have greater than 80% reduction in fish spawning biomass. Um, so another way that we can use this data is kind of to adjust expectations of future productivity, given assumptions on changes in species population dynamics in response to climate change. So kind of informing folks that this is kind of where we may be headed, given our different assumptions. We have a drop in productivity, whether we're including M or not, but it's going to be more extreme in one case versus the other. We can kind of balance those things out. We can also look at um, recruitment as well over these top three um, series. Again, REN being 2.6, which is what we're looking at for um, the Paris Climate Agreement, um, more extreme values. And again, for all three of these, um, we see consistency out to about 2050 on these projections and then uh, separating out for the three models. And again, without M included as an environmental link, we got quite a bit more variability than when we do include it. But in all three cases, we see this drop in recruitment across all three areas. So you can evaluate um, possible impacts of climate change on these individual model processes and uncertainty around these assumptions. So to conclude, I'm going to talk about our future work. Um, really want to testing environmental links through resampling. So one of the ways that I do test this is I go back and randomize uh, these time series, these environmental indices, and then feed them back into the model multiple times. And we see if the random values actually provide um, the same amount of um, predictability or likelihood within the model. Um, we want to test further testing and inclusion of environmental indices from downscaled CMIX-6 and projected ROMs output. So we're going to be um, in the Gulf of Alaska looking at taking ROMs and projecting it forward using these CMIX-5 and CMIX-6 climate projections. And we'll, we'll be able to feed those into the model directly. Um, develop other indices from current bioenergetics models. So Pearson Holzman and Grant Adams are working on various multi-species models and bioenergetics models that we can actually pull pieces from that and feed into the single species stock assessment. Development of more realistic MSEs using economic rejections that drive the fishery. So one of the uncertainties that we have um, is how the fishery is going to react uh, to these changes in the ecosystem and, and to the fish population. And economists can help inform us on how that may happen. So give us a more realistic management strategy evaluation that way. Um, development of control rules that take into account the non-stationary effects of climate change and stock production. So we can look at that decrease in productivity and do we need to adjust our control rules based on uh, our control rules or reference points based on that. And then also looking at ensemble weighting of future climate scenarios. So not all of these climate scenarios are equally likely and we can assign different weights and therefore drive that our values forward. Um, and then in summary, um, stock synthesis remains a useful tool in our assessment toolbox. It's been around for 35 years, has a wide following. Um, recent advancements allow for relatively easy development of ecosystem with models. And the current method for projections are likely adequate for one to two year projections. That's stuff that Jimmy and Ellie put together for us uh, 25 years ago, are actually still working quite well for our short term projections, one to two years, which is where we're setting ABCs and OFLs. Um, but if we're looking forward more than two years, um, we'll require much more thought in the face of a changing, changing climate. So as climate change ramps up and becomes 
becomes more um, impactful, we're going to have to look uh, more closely at our control rules and our reference points and um, look at different ways of doing that. And stock synthesis provides one way of doing that. There's a lot of other ways that are being worked on. So uh, I'd like to thank all my co-conspirators. Quite a large group of folks have helped me out with this. Um, Karen Aiden, Ben Fissel, Kirsten Holzman, Ben Laurel, Wayne Paulson, Lauren Rogers, Stephanie Zador, Kalei Shotwell, Wien Yang, Young Yang, um, as well as XCD, XKCD.com for their comics and The New Yorker for all their great cartoons. Um, thank you. And I think I'm ready for questions. Um, if I don't get to your question, here's my email and phone number. Um, contact me and I'll get to them. Excellent. And Thank you so much, Steve. Um, it's, a, it's great. So audience, we do have uh, about 15 minutes to answer your questions. So please continue to type them in the questions chat box that's on the right side, and I will read them to Steve. Um, this is also a really good time to download the slides from the presentation, if you'd like a copy. Steve, thank you for providing them for the audience. Um, they are located, if you look to the right, under handouts. It's a drop-down menu. Um, and one more thing, a little plug as I wait for questions. Um, since this webinar was recorded, we encourage you to share the link with interested colleagues or watch the beginning of the presentation if you joined us late. You can find the recording on the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel. Let me see, it looks like we might have gotten a question. Um, okay, so we have our first question. It says, uh, sorry if I missed this, for the positive effect of temperature on growth, the models or will the models include bioenergetics component based on food availability? Well, great question. I want to, and that's something that we're doing um, in the Seattle model um, developed by Kirsten Holzman. And so taking those results from that model and feeding them into the um, single, uh, single species stock assessment model is possible and we'll probably be able to do it. Hopefully with our projections, right now our projections for ROMs, um, our ecosystem projections, oceanography projections only go through 2017, but there is an effort out there right now to actually fit that with the CMAP projections and push that forward out to 20 and 2100. So in the future that's possible um, when we fit them into these multi-species models, but at the moment we can't, but it would be really useful. Um, so yes, but not yet. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, the person thanks you. Uh, we just got another question. Um, it says, enjoyed the talk. What should managers do if climate change is going to cause a stock to go extinct? Catch as many as possible before they go away? Stop fishing immediately or something else? Probably something else, because we have to take into account the other aspects of the ecosystem and um, local communities. So the ecosystem needs as much as it can to adapt, but so do the local communities. So stopping fishing altogether is going to have to happen for some stocks, but hopefully um, we can draw that out and allow for some adaptation. Um, for the cod stocks, what we see, we can look down south and see what happened, um, like Puget Sound and those areas where the stock is kind of dwindled. There's still a a stock that's there, uh, it's just very small. Um, and so it still plays a part in the ecosystem, just a much smaller role. And so moving forward in Alaska, if these trends hold true as things move north, that's probably going to have to happen, but there needs to be a point where communities can also be allowed to adapt. And so turning it off altogether, right off the get-go is gonna be problematic for those communities, um, both human and and, and ecosystem. So my, <laughs> it's kind of a complicated answer. And it's kind of, I think our control rules in Alaska are, are pretty good at this where we ramp down fishing quite rapidly as things go down. Um, and in fact, the, the B20 rule is an ecosystem rule for stellar sea lions where, we're, where we do shut off the fishery um, at B20. The question is, is that, is that appropriate. Um, and I think a lot of these um, multi-species models such as Seattle and some of the other ones are going to be better able to answer that question. 
So at what point does continuing fishing actually do much more damage than, than it can? And at what point economically does it no longer make sense to be fishing these, these stocks? It's a, it's a really good and hard question. I think I babbled my way through that. <laughs> No, it's, it's a very good question. Um, there's another very good question here. Uh, the, this person says, thank you for the presentation. The graphs are pretty compelling. Unless I don't understand what you presented, which is possible, the future is impacted by climate change. What prevents councils and NIMPs from incorporating climate change into decisions? I don't think there's anything that's preventing the councils. At least in Alaska, we're, we're considering that quite a bit. Um, we're looking at those projections forward and kind of looking at how do we adapt to it. Right now, our our fisheries management is really based on what I, what I presented in the in in the presentation of, of stationarity. It's based on our our thoughts and our, our findings from the past 40 years. Um, what we're doing in Alaska is really taking a hard look in that hard look at that and how do we deal with this non-stationarity effect. Do we, and, and it's a more difficult problem than you think. It's not just ratcheting down of fishing, it's ratcheting down of our reference points. Um, so if we expect the productivity of the stock to drop down, do we drop down our expectations for the stock? Or for instance, our unfished spawning biomass um, is being used for determining what that shutoff point is. So V20, V20% of the unfished stock, is where we shut off the fishery, but what if our actual productivity stock drops down, so our reference point has to drop down? So our level of B20 would be much lower for the stock, but does that make sense for stellar sea lions? So we're, we're, we are considering climate change um, regularly. And in fact, in Alaska, we have the ecosystem status reports, the ESR, which look at each of the ecosystems and how it's changing. Um, moving forward and how do we take that into account. We have ESPs for each species, ECOS, uh, ESP, ecosystem and socioeconomic report, no, um, processes. And that's being used to kind of look at individual species. And then we also have these things called risk tables that we're using. So what are the risks to a specific species and how does that, how should we, uh, how should that affect our um, allowable biological catch? And Given what we're seeing in the in the near future, um, or what we expect in the future, should we ratchet down our catch levels based on what we're seeing in the current climate? And climate change isn't something that's in the future; it's happening now, and we're adjusting our management based on what's happening now and what we see. Um, and we see climate change happening as we speak, um, particularly in the fisheries in Alaska. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any more questions. Um, audience, if you want to take advantage of this moment to ask Steve a question live, it's a, we do have a few more minutes. We have about seven minutes to go. Um, and meanwhile, I'm going to make another plug for the library as hopefully you type in your question. Um, if you're interested in attending um, more library seminars, please consider subscribing to our listserv. Uh, go to library.noaa.gov. Under services, select library seminars and subscribe under upcoming seminars. Let's give this another minute. Sometimes there's a little bit of a delay in getting questions to you. But meanwhile, I want to thank you, Steve. This has been great, very interesting, a little bit depressing. <laughs> Not depressing. I mean, we're we're no, we're changing our system, and we're we're adapting. And that's something yes. that we have to. Um, and there's other species out there that are doing quite well. I mean, if you look at sablefish in our region. It's going through the roof right now. So I mean, there's going to be winners and losers. Cod just happens to be one of those fish that appears to be a loser at the moment um, and into the future with climate change. Absolutely. Uh, Kristen, did you want to put in a last plug for next week's presentation? Um, yeah, thanks, Steve, for putting up the information there on the screen. Um, so this is a project that um, Steve and Stephanie and, and all of the other um, collaborators that Steve mentioned have been working on together. Um, so next week's will focus on some more of the ecosystem details of the project. So if you want to hear more, tune in on Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific, 
um, for additional details. If you can't make that time, the library puts recordings of all the presentations on their YouTube channel, so you can check it out at another time. Um, but yeah, thank you, Steve. Great presentation, really interesting work. Um, and yeah, to Lisa's point, a little bit sad for the, the COD story, but um, really great advancement on the science side. So I appreciate you sharing the work. It's really interesting to hear about. Yeah, I totally agree. The slides are great too. I'm gonna to download. Um, I don't see any more questions, so I guess we'll go ahead and conclude our presentation. Again, thank you, Steve. Um, and also, Kristen, thank you for organizing the series. This is always wonderful every each month. Um, I truly appreciate that you joined us today for the seminar. Uh, NOAA Central Library is proud to present the work of the NOAA community, its partners, and we hope you will join us again. So be well, and thank you so much. Thanks, Lisa.